In this video, we're gonna add on to the input field we created in the last video and let you actually respond to user input. So if I type something like hello, you'll see a response come back from the server. We'll also make sure that if you continue to type things, we add a scroll bar so that you can mouse back over the history of what's been typed and see your input over time. Let's get started. So in the last video, this is where we left off. We were able to process text input or to allow the user to type it, but we weren't actually processing or handling it or you know taking the input when the user entered it. But now we're gonna get to the fun stuff and we're gonna start learning how to process the input that the user enters when they hit the enter key. So in order to do that, there's a couple things we need to do. The first thing we need to talk about are signals. And so any node or any scene in Godot is able to emit a signal. If you've programmed in other languages, signals are the same as actions or dispatchers or um, observer. It's really just that same pattern that's common in so many different languages where you have some kind of a signal or event that happens and is dispatched and then there are subscribers or listeners. So signals are, are basically events or actions. And then you can have different nodes or scenes subscribe or listen to those events. In Godot, it's called emitting a signal and connecting to a signal instead of dispatch and subscribe or whatever you're used to. So there are a couple ways to connect to signals that an element has or that a node has. You can do it via code, but you can also do it by the editor. And that's what we're gonna do right now. And so if I select our input field here and then come over not to the inspector tab, but select this node button, you're gonna see signals and groups. We're not gonna go over groups right now. Groups are basically like tags in Unity, pretty much the same thing. We might use them later on, but no need right now. But you'll see a bunch of signals. Some of them are common to every single type of scene or item in Godot, like nodes and objects and canvas items. Some are unique to control nodes, so you see a bunch of things about focus and GUI input, mouse entered and exited. And then there's ones that are specific to the specific type of node you're dealing with, so like a line edit. And the line edit node has a signal called text entered. And if you hover over it, you'll see that this signal gets emitted or dispatched when the user presses the enter key on the line edit, which is exactly what we want. We want to, whenever the user enters, like hits the enter key, to respond to whatever is currently inputted in that input field. And so we can connect to this signal and do something with it and handle the input that we're getting in. So in order to connect, we can either click on this text entered, oh, whoops, uh, we can click on text entered and we can hit the connect button here down at the bottom, or we can just double click it and then connect it there. And so when you connect a signal, you have to select which script or which node, which scene to connect it to. Now, we only have a script right now on our input field, and we don't really want to um, connect it here because we want our input field to be responsible for uh, letting the user input stuff. We don't actually want to have it processing that input, so we need to create another script on something else. And for now, what we're going to do is select our game, so the top level node here, and we're going to attach a script to it. So I'll click the attach, attach script button and we'll just call it game.gd and hit create. So we'll let the default work. And you'll see now in our file system, we not only have an input script, but a game script. And then in our script view here, we can switch in between those two as needed. In our input script, remember all we were doing is grabbing the focus when our node enters the scene tree. And in our game script, we've got a bunch of boilerplate that gets added in there by Godot. And we're gonna change this in a second. So. If I save our game, then select our game node here so that we come back to the, the 2D view, I can select our input now and double click the text entered signal to connect it to our game script. So we'll have our game kind of be responsible for delegating the handling and processing of input away from the actual entering of it. So we're delegating responsibilities. We're keeping code modular. It's only doing one thing. This is a term in programming often called the single responsibility principle, which is each piece of code or each item or element or object should really only be responsible for one type of thing. So the code in our input field is only gonna deal with handling input coming in or, or, or dealing with the user typing, but our game can handle delegating the processing of that input somewhere else. So I'm gonna hit connect. 
And now we'll see in our game script here, we have this on input text entered function and it's gonna autofill with a name and parameters for this function. And remember, if we come here, we see that text entered, uh, you can you can change this, this, this down here to change the default generated function name. But remember we see here in our signal view that this signal has a parameter. So it comes with information about the new text, like what text was entered. And so you'll see that once we connected this and it auto-generated the function that matches it, it's also gonna auto-generate this parameter as well. So we automatically have everything we need here. I'm gonna get rid of all the boilerplate to have the text that's entered. So just to show this, let's just print it out. In Godot, there's a print function and whatever you print here will just be set to the output down below. So we can just print out new text. And so now if I run our game, and I type something, so I'll type, hi friends, and I hit enter, we should see it appear down here in our output. So I hit enter, there it is. And I can keep doing it as much as we want. So this is great, we are taking the input once it's entered and we're doing something with it. Right now we're only printing it, which isn't what we want to do, but we're doing something. Now, another thing that would be cool is that when we enter text, this field was cleared out here because we don't want the user to be able to print the same thing uh, or to be able to just hit enter repeatedly. It's not a great experience for the user and it could just cause a ton of crap commands to get processed. So there's a couple things we could do. We're handling this on input text entered signal on our game script. So one thing we could do is we could somehow get a reference to our input all the way down this tree and then clear the text whenever the signal comes in. But that's kind of tedious and our game shouldn't have to be responsible for telling our input to clear its text. This is just part of handling user input is that whenever it's entered, we want our input field to know it should clear. So what we're gonna do is actually connect another function to this same signal. So if I select our input and then come over to the text entered signal, we'll double click it again, but this time we're gonna connect it on our input field itself. So you can connect a signal from, in, from a node or scene to itself. So we will connect this on input text entered signal to itself. So we'll create a new function here and we'll see that we now have this new function. It matches what's in our game, but it's on our input node. And here what we can do is just say text dot clear, or actually we don't even need to do that. There's a clear function built in to input fields. So we can just call clear here and now if I run our game and I type, hello friends, we'll see it appear below, but we'll also see our input be cleared. Boom, just like that. So it's really easy to do that in Godot. Whatever I type, whenever we enter it, it clears our input. And now we've got something that's really starting to feel and look like a text adventure game. We're handling input the way that a user would expect it to be handled and the experience is much better now. So just that to show that you can connect multiple functions to the same signal, whether it's via code or via the editor like we did, and that's totally okay. Obviously you wanna be careful with connecting signals because those will get called, those functions will get called every time that single signal is admitted. So you know, you're trying to be responsible with it, but for us, you know, the user's only gonna hit the enter key after they've typed something. It's not like it's happening every single frame, so it's totally fine for us to connect both of these, sig or both of these functions to that same signal. Okay, so now we've got something where the user can enter text, it's gonna clear the text once it's entered, and we're receiving the text that was entered, but it'd be really cool if we could actually start displaying either um, responses from the game or at least kind of giving a history of what the user has entered to them. So let's add something like that. Now, in order to do that, we're gonna be able to start populating our game info area, which we haven't really touched yet. And so in order to do that, we're gonna need a couple things. One is that we kind of wanna have a scrollable history of all of our game input and we can uh, edit how much of that history should that be remembered like how many commands should the game show and remember and let the user scroll back through but we want to at least have some functionality that does that but the importance here is it needs to be vertical so we need to stack things vertically here and we already know how to do that we've added a node that lets us do that a couple times now and it's a vbox container so i'm going to select our game info area and add a vbox container and again this is going to be our history 
uh, rows and we'll talk about how to make it scrollable later. For now, we'll just add this and make it, make it work as needed. And so typically when you look at old school games, they, uh, the way that they handled player input is they would reprint that input out on the info, the history screen, but then also show the response right below it. So we're going to try and recreate that. So we're going to build out what that will look like right now. And then we're going to save it as a scene so we can reuse it multiple times. So in order to do that, I need an egg in uh, another VBox container because we want this to be a, we want each set of prompt and response to be their own kind of thing. So I'm going to say input response for this new VBox container. And this is going to be kind of our parent node for our responses. So we're going to be able to, to create new ones of these scenes, new scenes of input responses that we can continue to use over and over. And so in our input response, there's going to be two things. There's going to be a first label, and this is going to say input history, and we're going to duplicate that. I'm going to hit command D and call this response. And so our input history is going to be something like this. Um, also for both of these, let me select them both. And then I'm going to come down to custom fonts and we'll drag in, we'll start with the 28. So it'll be the same size for now. So I'll drag in the 28 there. And then for our input history, I'm going to do similar to what we did with our carrot space, carrot space, so that it matches what's below and say, this is what the user typed. And then here I'm going to say, this is what the game will give back. And so what I'm going to do to kind of make this look a little bit better is a couple things. One is I think I'm going to bring the font on this one down on the history, just so it's like, this is less important than what the game is saying back. So I'm going to bring the font down a bit. So this is what the user typed and you might want to find like, we might do a 24 here. So I might actually, let's just do that just so we have a bit of um, variance in our fonts. So I'll create a new 24 font, bump this up to 24. So I duplicated our 16 and bumped it up, the duplicate up to 24, and we can drag this 24 in. So it's slightly smaller, but not too much, but it's noticeable. And I think I'm going to make the color of this, this uh, input history a little darker. So again, we're bringing attention to the response and not to what the user typed. So I can go to custom colors here and change this font color and I can change it to just a slightly more gray one, something up in here, about half gray. But just, again, so now you look, the attention is clear here. It's drawing your eye to this um, response, and this is just kind of here as reference. You don't, this isn't actually what you're being focused on. One other thing is we notice there is a bit of, we probably want a bit of a margin here. So in order to do that, um, we can add a margin container to our history rows or to our game info section. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. This will be good for now. So this is kind of what we want, want to have going for us. And so in Godot, um, we, we, basically what we want to do is whenever the user types something, we want to create one of these objects. We want to create a VBox container that has two children like this to give us the ability to do something like that, where we have a reusable scene, we can actually right click on our input response container on this one. So right click on this and we can hit save branch as scene. And what this is gonna do, and I'll just do input response, keep the default name and hit save. This is gonna save our input response as its own scene branch. And you'll notice I can't actually expand it now, but I can hit this button and it'll open the scene up in a different window. And this right here is the power of Godot. You can save any collection of nodes, even a single node itself as their own scene. And you can reuse that scene and customize it in your game as many times as you want. All of a sudden now we have this really nice reusable input response scene where we can eventually add a script to handle setting what these two text fields should contain. But we can keep reusing this as many times as we need in our game. And it's gonna give us a really nice, easy way to keep adding responses every time the, or the user types something. So now that we have this input response, we can actually get rid of it because we don't want one to be there. We're gonna actually load it into our game. And the way we're gonna do that is by coming into our game script. And so there are a couple ways that you can give scenes that are not in your game, give basically, they're like prefabs in Unity. There's a couple ways that you can load those in. One is to um, do it via the editor. There's certain ways you can make export variables, they're called. We'll get to that later on in the series. But the way we're going to do it now is using preload. 
So preload is a function you can use in any Godot script that will load in something from into memory upon the whenever that script is parsed. So I can do const, and we're gonna say const here because this, we want this to be constant. It's never gonna change. And this is gonna be input response. We want to uppercase this. We're gonna Pascal case this because it is a, a packed scene itself. It's the scene data, but it is not an actual game object. It's not a scene or a node in our game. It is holding the data for what that scene should look like in memory. And so, because it's basically, think of it as a class. It's a script class, but not an actual instance in our game. And so we, it's like an abstract class that we need to instance whenever we want one in our game. And so we're gonna use Pascal case here. And I'm gonna use preload, this function built into Godot. And then I just have to give it the path to our scene. And this is gonna be res and then input response as we see down here. So I can find that in the autofill, hit enter, and it'll just be there. And all of a sudden, whenever our game loads and this script is parsed, we are going to save the data for this input response scene into this input response variable. And now what we can do is whenever we enter text, we can create a new one. But we wanna make sure we're creating it as a child of this history rows object. So first we need to get a reference to that. And in order to do that, we're gonna type on ready, one word, var, and this is gonna be history rows. And then I'm gonna say equal sign and then the dollar sign and just start typing history rows and we'll find it here. Godot's gonna autofill it for our scene tree. And let me break down what's happening in this line. When you want to get access to a, a node or a scene in your tree, you can use this dollar sign to select it. So this is just the path of this history rows scene in our tree. You'll notice background, margin container, rows, game info, history rows. That matches exactly what the, the uh, code is right here. So this is how you select a scene or a node in your game that's currently in your tree and affect it. However, you want to make sure that whenever you do this, that you're only doing it after this specific scene you're trying to access is in your scene tree. We know in Godot, whenever the ready function fires, so I'm gonna add it to this right here. Whenever the ready function fires of a parent, you can guarantee that all of its children have also already been ready. They've already already been ready to the, or added to the scene tree. So within the ready function of our game, for example, it is safe to assume that all of its children, which are all of these, have been added to the tree. However, within the ready function of our game info, for example, if we added a script here, we could not assume that we could access our background node from within it because background is not a child of game info. You can't guarantee that actually game info will always be readied before background is, and thus you don't wanna access it. So you only wanna use this to access children to go down the tree not upwards but because in our game script here in our game scene we can always be sure that when our game is readied when this ready function is called it is safe to access our history rows because history rows is further into the tree it's a child and so what we could do is we could say something like background the same thing we had up there where we can do history rows because we know it's safe to access history rows here so var history rows However, it gets really tedious when you're writing this for every single thing you want to access, every scene you want to access. So Godot provides a helper and it's this on ready keyword here. So when you prefix variable with on ready, uh, it's what it's going to do. And you can only do this at the top of your scene what it, or at the top of your script. It's going to say, hey, when we're going to fire this ready function, but right before we actually do, then we're going to load in history rows. We're going to load in this node path into a variable. So this on ready means that it's gonna happen right as we're calling ready. It's gonna happen when it's safe to, safe to access this node, but before the ready function is fired. So if I try and do print history rows, not only will there be a value in history rows because we're accessing this variable, this scene, this history row scene when it's safe to do so, we'll also be able to print it out here because this happens right before the ready function is called. So this is a super helpful way in Godot. Basically, whenever you wanna keep track of a child node or child scene, this is usually the best way to do it. Anyway, just a little bit of info on why we're doing this and what this line means and how to access scenes in Godot from within code. 
So now that we have access to this history rows, we're ready to add scenes to it. And so what we want to do, I'm gonna get rid of this ready function here because we don't need it, is whenever we enter text, so whenever we enter new text, now instead of printing it, what we're gonna do is say var input response equals, and this is gonna be capital input response dot instance. So there's a couple things going on here. Remember that this capital input response here is the data itself. It's not the input response scene. And whenever we wanna add that to our game, we need to actually create an in instance of that input response scene. And so we're gonna create an instance of it and then save it to this lowercase, the snake case input response variable. So this one, this variable contains an actual instance of our input response scene. Whereas this is just the data of that scene. It is a packed scene, packed into a data, a resource. So now we've got in this lowercase input response here, our actual instance that we wanna deal with. So it's not enough to just instance something in Godot though. We actually need to add it to our scene tree as a child of something for it to be visible. And in order to do that, we wanna add it as a child of our history rows. So we can actually just say history rows dot add child, and we're just gonna give it the node, which in this case is input response. So what we're doing here is saying, we're gonna add, we're gonna create an instance of our input response scene, and then we're gonna add that scene, that input response as a child of our history rows. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna be the same thing as if we add our input response here. It's doing the exact same thing that we just did by adding manually via the editor, input response as a child of history rows. And if we continue to do that, we're just gonna create more and more of them. So you're learning right now how to do via code what we're doing by the editor right here. So I'm gonna delete all of these. By the way, um, we've talked before about this plus button lets you create built-in Godot nodes. This little chain button here lets you instance a scene that you've created. So if you wanna, you wanna create and add to your scene tree something that you've created, your own scene, like our game or input response, you would use this little chain button up here or link button, I'm not, I think it's a chain, whatever though, you get, the, you get the point. So now that we have this, we can run our game and see that whenever we type something, so I type hello, we're gonna get a new response. And obviously it's not responding to anything we type, but it's being added to our scene, which is exactly what we want. There's an issue though, that if we keep going, it's gonna keep pushing things down lower and lower in our game, which is not what we want. So this is where we need to add a scroll container to properly handle this. Okay, so in order to add a scroll container, what we're gonna do is come back to our scene. I'm gonna click on game info here, and I'm gonna hit command A and look up scroll container. So Godot actually has a built-in scroll container that'll automatically handle adding vertical and horizontal scroll. You can access vertical and horizontal scroll bars yourself to manually add them, but the scroll container is much easier and it will configure a lot of it under the hood. So we're gonna add that. Now, if I add the scroll container as a child of our game info section, you'll see it's got this little warning thing on it. And if I mouse over it, it'll say, hey, use a container as a child of a scroll container, like a VBox or a HBox. Well, good news is that we have a VBox container here in our history rows. So we're gonna drag this to be a child of our scroll container and we'll see that warning go away. Now, on our scroll container, there's a couple things we need to configure. So if I select it and come over to the scroll property, you'll see that there's a horizontal scroll enabled section here. We don't want to horizontal scroll, we just want vertical scrolling. So I'm gonna turn this off. And that actually should be good enough for now. So if I run our game, and just start typing a bunch of things, you'll very quickly see we actually get an error that crashes our game. And the problem is that it's saying, hey, we're, you're trying to call the function add child. So we're calling it right here. You're trying to call add child on a null instance. So that's saying and telling us that history rows is null. And the reason that history rows is null is because we had this hard coded node path here but it's since been updated. There's a scroll container in the mix now that we haven't accounted for and thus it can't resolve history rows. So the way to fix that is we have to find what's changed in our node path. So we have rows, game info. Okay, and it's after game info that the scroll container should be there. So after game info in our path here, I'm gonna say scroll container so that it matches what's in our scene tree. Now, this is somewhat tedious. 
uh, admittedly. There are ways around this. You can use Godot has a built-in node path that lets you do drag and drop and it'll automatically update. We won't cover that because this isn't so much of a big deal here, but just as an example, um, I wanted to go through and kind of debug this error just so you can see why you're getting it. Because this is a, this uh, attempting to call a function in base null instance is a very common error. And it's almost always because you have a variable you forgot to update the path or is being set null somewhere. You're using it before it's ready. So now if we start our game and I start adding a bunch of things and typing it, you'll see that all of a sudden we have a scroll bar. It's not actually pushing everything else in the game down, but it's letting us scroll through all of the input that we have in our game. So this is perfect. In this video now, we've got a game that lets us respond to user input and print something back out. It also lets us scroll as we continue to add more and more user input. In the next video, we'll actually handle um, getting moving our scroll bar to the bottom when the user types an input and being able to manually set and change what this input and response is coming back from the game. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I hope this video has been helpful. If it has, a like and subscribe to support the channel are always appreciated. We'd love to have you in our Discord server. The link to that is in the description. You can ask any questions about the tutorial there. And if you find my work helpful, donating a coffee on Buy Me A Coffee, linked also in the description, is really helpful and helps me continue to make great tutorials. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next video.